how you how's everyone doing i hope you all are enjoying b sides um welcome to b sides 2019 our speaker roger grimes and um, roger has authored over uh, he's had over 30 years of computer security experience he's authored over 10 books and uh, thousands of articles, 1,400 articles, and he's a weekly columnist with Info, Info uh, World and CSO Weekly. He, he finds many computer uh, uh, security systems to be more confusing than quantum mechanics, so that's why he selected this topic, Day When Quantum Computers Breaks Crypto. So welcome, Roger, and thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me here, and it's nice to see this is a geeks within a geeks uh, uh, thing uh, when you're showing up for quantum mechanics and quantum computing. Uh, my name's Roger Grimes. My voice is going because I got a cold, uh, which is great when you're a speaker for a living and your voice is going to eke out. But I, I, so I normally sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone. Today, I don't know what I sound like. Uh, but also because this conference opened with a really bad joke, I'll, I'll give you a really bad quantum physics joke. Uh, quantum physicist goes into a bar, he asks the bartender for a beer, and he puts the beer in the middle of a stool beside him. And the bartender can't help but notice, says, why are you putting the, you know, the beer on the stool? He said, well, you know, according to the, 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 the quantum physics doctor says, according to quantum physics, uh, atoms can be anything. They can be particles of waves, and they can turn into anything in any infinite uh, possibilities. That beer may turn into a beautiful woman. And the bartender's looking around, he sees all these other beautiful women throughout the bar. He goes, why don't you pick up that beer and hand it to one of these beautiful women around here and be nice to them and talk to them, and maybe they'll, you know, they'll, you'll be able to get up with them. And, he's, and the quantum physicist guy said, what's the odds of that? <laughs> boom, boom, boom. That's right. Uh, so I work for No Before. We're a security awareness, the most popular security awareness and training vendor, 23,000 uh, customers. Uh, here are some of the books I've written. The last one was Data Driven Defense, Data Driven Computer Security Defense. None of these books have anything to do with quantum uh, physics. Uh, or, uh, or security quantum computers. Uh, it's been a hobby of mine, though, for about 20 years. And all I can tell you is I read about one to two books a year on it, and uh, it hurts my head. It hurts my head. But uh, about six months ago, I was at a conference, and I ran into one of my first uh, quantum physicist professors of some guy that was actually named, his name's uh, Dr. Mark Jackson. He's with uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing. He was actually working. He's working on several quantum computer projects. He actually works with quantum computers every day. And he was given a keynote, and he said, I think that the day when quantum finally breaks public key crypto is only one or two or three years away. And I was kind of like falling asleep and I woke up. I was like, what? He's like, any questions? Like, yeah, how, how sure are you of that you know, thing that it's only going to be one or two or three years away? He said, I'm very accurate. Uh, and I'm a reporter type guy on the side. So I did a lot of reporting, did a lot of research. And I couldn't find a whole lot of people uh, that would back up his claim because the joke is quantum computing is always 10 years away. Uh, but so I called him back. I said, the only people I can get that agree with you are the people that are working with you, that have some project with you. And he said, well, all the people that disagree with me, are they building and working with actual quantum computers? today and I went no they're at universities and the theoretical guys and blah 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 and he goes there's your answer so he's feeling quite quite confident so I'll talk real quickly about what quantum and quantum computing is how long till quantum computing breaks most public key crypto and how to prepare that's the biggest part uh, but if you haven't been around quantum before it's really really strange stuff uh, a single particle can be two different things in two different places at the same time. So it can be both what they call a particle or a wave. A lot of times uh, quantum stuff is talking with electrons. So not only can it be a particle or a wave, it can be both a particle and a wave and be in two different places at once. It can be both the first and the last event inside of an ordered series of events. Uh, the fuzzy entanglement's probably the weirdest one, and that's where they can actually take these two particles and fuzzy entangle them in such a way they don't know why it works, but what they do know is that even if this particle is a million miles away from this particle, when they spin this particle, this particle always spins. It's called fuzzy entanglement, and they don't know how it does it. It does it faster than the speed of light. Uh, every experiment that's ever been done to disprove quantum physics, uh, Einstein kind of, uh, he was one of the foremost people to kind of start discovering quantum physics. He ultimately, a couple years later, said, I don't believe in it, and he tried to disprove it uh, towards his death. He couldn't disprove it. Every experiment that's ever been done to disprove quantum physics has failed. Every experiment ever done to prove that it does exist has succeeded, and most of the Nobel Prizes in physics for the last 10 
10, 15 years have been quantum physics people. Uh, and I have reporters call me sometimes go, how long till we get quantum computers? Uh, we've had quantum computers that would only be working if quantum was true since uh, 1998. We have hundreds of quantum computers today. It is not a theoretical, it isn't are they coming, they are here and exponentially getting real, a lot better real fast. Uh, some other weird things like teleportation is absolutely possible. So if you're a Star Trek fan, you really love that idea, except for they have to destroy the originals. So I'm not sure if I want to be the beta tester for that. Uh, but I love the other thing is that the answers are, can be in another universe. Uh, that is that when I read that, that the answers are in another universe, I thought I must have not understood the concept or the definition of universe, you know, according to scientists. Uh, so I called my friend, Dr. Mark Jackson. I was like, hey, I see here that the answers are in another universe. That's where you're getting the answers. He's like, yes. I was like, well, does that mean like universe, universe, like multiverse, like there's multiple universes? He's like, yes. He goes, don't you know the quantum physics property that you can't look at something? When you look at something, it changes the way it is. That's another property of quantum particles, is merely looking at the quantum particle changes the quantum particle. And I was like, yeah, he goes, so we actually fuzzy entangle particles in this universe with the particles in the other universe that we can't see. And when the particles in the other universe spin and become data, we can see it in the particles that are fuzzy entangled over here. Uh, and that's when I knew that I really wasn't smart because if, if I was working on a project and they told me the answers are in another universe, I would have gone, well, guess I'm not going to solve that. I need to go work on something else easier. Uh, but the quantum scientists went, oh, this actually solves a problem we have. Uh, so that kills two birds with one stone. That's when I knew that I wasn't that smart. I know, I don't know. This is a theorem in math. You know, I, regular, I can't look at the math of cr regular crypto. When you start looking at quantum crypto math, it's just, I, you have to go yada, yada, yada. It's like the lyrics of a song you really like, but you really don't know the lyrics. Same thing with quantum physics. You just have to look over the math. Uh, but I love this. I love this quote here. Those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. And any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Let me give you another one of my favorite quantum examples. Um, a cool thing to tell somebody on a romantic night when you're looking up at the stars is, hey, the light from that star takes, you know, millions of miles to get here, and the speed of light is, what, 886,000 miles per second. So that star that you see is not where that star is. That's where that star was four years ago, ten years ago, a million years ago, or whatever. Uh, turns out it's only four, four degrees over. Uh, for the farthest star, so it's not that far away. But I like to tell them that so they think I'm smart. I'm like, that. those stars aren't where they are. That's where they were when the light started from that star. But according to quantum mechanics, when that electron from that star enters your eye, it changes how the electron left the star four years ago or a million years ago. That's how freaking weird quantum mechanics is, is that you, you, the mere act of you observing the particle changed the particle when it was emitted in the past. Pretty wild. So the quantum break is the idea that quantum computers are likely to break most traditional public key crypto, not all crypto, but a lot of it. Uh, and it's all, as a matter of fact, it's only going to impact traditional public key crypto that uses discrete logarithm math to, to be safe. So it's only RSA and Diffie-Hellman and ECC and Elgamal and PKI and digital certificates and digital signatures and TLS and HTTPS, VPNs, Wi-Fi protection, smart cards, HSMs that protect those smart cards, cryptocurrencies, two-factor authentication, FIDO keys, Google security keys. It's only that. So, yeah, so you can pretty much relax. The rest of it's handled. Uh, but what is quantum computing? Again, traditional computers are binary. Each bit can be a one or a zero at one time. It can't be both. So it's either one or a zero, negative or positive, on or off, but only each bit can only be one thing at one time. A qubit, or a quantum bit, first theorized in 1959, it can be two states at one time. So it's every qubit is exponential, uh, and it's the, uh, yeah, pretty wild, the results can be in another universe. Uh, but that's the pretty wild thing about it is that, you know, one qubit gives you two bits, two qubits give you four bits, three qubits gives you eight bits. But if you have enough qubits to solve a particular problem, it can give you every possible answer to that problem, and you can figure out what the right answer was. I didn't know, I'll explain to you how that is the case, but that's a pretty wild thing. Uh, why do we need quantum computing? Well, think about this. If we were trying to calculate all the possible combinations from a chessboard, which is 2 to the 64th options, and each option is represented by a grain of rice, then the number of grains of rice would be as high as Mount Everest. 
And that's pretty wild, right? 29,000 feet or whatever. And if you were to then go to 2 to the 2048 bits, which is the average traditional public key crypto key today, it'd be 1,985 Mount Everest's worth, worth of grains of rice. Uh, conventional computers can't do it. If you were to add up every conventional computer that we have ever had, ever will have, uh, and all the energy and hard drive space it would take, there's not enough atoms or energy in our universe to solve that problem using a traditional method. Just can't be done. Quantum computers can do it in about 160, 120 uh, seconds, 110 seconds, 120 seconds. They can solve that type of problem. Um, that's probably more the yeah, it's theoretical at this point. But we're, again, we're probably two to three years away, according to Dr. Mark Jackson. Uh, could be 10 years away, whatever. The, and we're going to see where exponentially we're, we're a whole lot closer. I, I really do think that within the next couple of years, that quantum break will happen. Um, so again, 1998 was the first working computer, two qubits, and you can see that it went from 12 to 28 to 84 to 1,000 and so on. Google's now developing them, Microsoft's developing, IBM's now developing. We now have a 2,048-bit qubit computer, although it's not the type that necessarily breaks crypto really well. Uh, you can, there's at least 100 qu uh, 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 quantum computers that you can count today, and there's several of them that you can access on the internet. Uh, there's, there's, quantum, uh, there's quantum computing chips, quantum computing computers. Uh, the, there's a bunch of countries, China and Russia and America, everybody's fighting to figure out to be the first one to make that quantum supremacy. Uh, a lot of them are super cooled, down to absolute zero. Uh, the D-Wave ones, those are the first ones. It was 1,024 qubits. Now they got 2,048 qubits. They'll probably have 4,096 soon. But that particular type of computer that D-Wave makes is called an annealing quantum computer, and it can be faster one day, but it's not going to be able to break primes. It takes a, what's called a quantum gate computer uh, to break primes. Uh, not all qubits are alike again. There's many different methods to generate them. Uh, superconducting is one where you have to have the absolute Kelvin. Uh, there's trapped ion, which is pretty popular. I think there's something like 16 different ways to do quantum computers. Major interferon, that's a uh, Microsoft just did that one. Microsoft, I worked for Microsoft for 12 years, and I didn't know they were working on quantum computers at Microsoft Research, but they made that particular type of quantum computer uh, people did not think was possible to make, and then Microsoft came out and said they made that type, and they made it, it was only one qubit, and people were like, so what? Turns out that's the most stable kind, and if they can actually, they can make multiple multiple qubits out of it, it will probably be the type that ends up on our desktop because it doesn't, uh, doesn't require that you have temperatures at absolute Kelvin. Uh, but whatever quantum computers we probably get, it's probably going to be something kind of cloud-based anyways, or maybe like a quantum mathematical coprocessor. So you have your regular binary digital computers which do some things quite faster, even faster than quantum, and then it offloads, it will actually offload the quantum calculations to either the, the cloud or to a quantum processor chip, do the results, and then bring it back into the binary world. And it's always important to bring it back into the binary world because it doesn't stay in a stable state. The answer doesn't stay there long. It may not even be in the right universe. Um, so what we're looking for is universal gate quantum computers. They're the ones that are good at breaking primes. But so far, they have a smaller number of qubits. There's only 72 as of September 2018. I'm not sure where they are today, but it gets exponentially more and more and more. Uh, theoretically, <coughs> including the Shor's algorithm, which is calculating the number of bits that it takes to break all traditional public key crypto. It only takes like 40 or 60 bits or something like that. We've already uh, gone past that number of bits, but they're not stable bits. The data that we're trying to get is not staying uh, stable long enough, so we're actually having to invent more bits to make it stable. So yeah, stable qubits, very hard to make right now. Without the right conditions, they lose their needed quantum properties quite quickly, called decoherence, but we really want more coherence. Remember, merely observing them, uh, observing them makes them change. So we need them stable long enough so they complete the task and give us an answer. So today, we're getting, uh, we need a lot of the developed qubits that are in a processor to be error correcting or stabilization or controllable to work. So uh, for a long time, they thought it was going to only take 40 or 60 qubits to break the quantum supremacy, and now they think the answer is somewhere more around 2,000 to 10,000. Yeah, right now, they're uncontrollable, and so they're making a mistake once every 200 actions, which is horrible, right? And imagine if your PC CPU at you know, billions of times a second made a mistake every 200 times. So, but today, we do have quantum microprocessors. We have cloud-connected quantum computers you can play with, 
quantum random number generators, which are the only true random number generators in the world. We have multiple quantum programming languages, multiple quantum development kits, multiple quantum compilers. We have quantum networking, quantum encryption. And again, so uh, the point is uh, quantum supremacy is the point in time when quantum computers can solve problems that traditional binary computers cannot. We need at least 49 perfect qubits, according to Peter Shor's algorithm. We're either there or very near. IBM says we're, we were three years away. Google thought they were there in 2017. Intel says they're already there as well. And China says, well, we've had it. Uh, China actually did a couple of uh, satellite transmissions and proved they have it. But most of the people in the quantum field went, ah, we don't trust that. Imagine that, not trusting. <laughs> Uh, but it seems to be that everybody's getting closer and closer and closer to that. So what will quantum computers give us? A new understanding of physics in our universe? Uh, it, you know, it's already proven that it actually exists because the quantum computers would not work if it, you know, that the qubits that are there would not work if it wasn't for quantum properties. It can solve complicated math very quickly, so it's going to give us incredible precision for the military, weather, traffic, new medicines, better solar cells, new chemicals, true artificial intelligence, and things we cannot imagine. I've been in the computer field for over 30 years, and back when I started my first PC that had two floppy drives that I had to boot up on, I could not have imagined an iPod where I could put my entire music collection or the internet for that matter or any of our self-driving cars. We could imagine flying cars for some reason before we could do self-driving cars. I don't get that. But uh, and let me say, I trust a self-driving car more than a flying car. Like gravity really is be tough. Uh, but it's also going to break most traditional public key crypto and every secret that it protects. It's really not all crypto, just the ones that rely upon what's called the integer factorization problem or the discrete logarithm problem or the elliptical curve discrete logarithm problem, like all the things I told you about before. Uh, but it's also going to give us new unbreakable crypto because if somebody tries to look at something, it's going to change the state of the bits and you won't be able to break into it. So that's pretty cool. And there already are many quantum encrypting and decrypting algorithms out there. I've seen that for longer than I've seen quantum computers just about. But so how can it break it? So uh, you know, it's, it's basically calculating large, the, the large prime numbers. A prime number is any whole number after one that can be divided by itself in one. So you know, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, and so on can only be divided by themselves in one to get a whole number. Traditional public key cryptos like RSA and Diffie-Hellman is based upon the work effort needed to factor large prime number equations. And, and really, what it is, they take these two large prime numbers, p and q multiply them together, get a result, and I'm, I'm simplifying here, and the idea is that n is the public key, and even if I give you the result, the public key, you cannot figure out what two large prime numbers made that result. So it might be easy if I was to ask you what two prime numbers when multiplied together equals 15. You can probably figure that out today, right? Three and five. It gets a little bit harder if I say, what's, what is it if it's 187? Well, that might take you a little bit of time. I bet some people can figure it out now, but it might take most of us a couple of minutes. Right? It's 17 and 11. But suppose they give you a number like that. Well, there's nobody in here that's going to be able to do that easily. I don't think so, unless you're a Rain Man type of person. Uh, but computers can do that quite fast. But, and there's the answer. Just y'all, I was off by one when I tried it. I was just off by one. I was so close. Um, but now imagine that n is a prime number that's 2,048 bits long, like a really big number. You ca I can't even put it on the slides because it just doesn't show up right. Uh, you know, it goes around and around and around. Uh, but traditional computers are not very good at uh, figuring it out because it's more than the number of grains of rice in 100 and, or 1,985 Mount Everest's. There's not enough. I love when they go, there's not enough atoms in the known universe, you know, to, to do it. Like, they could have told me it's not, en not enough atoms in this microphone, and I would have been, oh, wow, that's pretty incredible. But when they tell me it's not enough atoms in the known universe, I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to pay for that bill. <laughs> so it takes more guesses than all the atoms in the known universe we've just talked about. Apparently, there's multiple universes, so maybe we can borrow some money from the other universe. So how long till they break it? So as of 2000, uh, or as 2018, the largest successfully factored primes is RSA 768. Took four years, an equivalent of almost 2,000 years of computing on a single core. RSA 2048 would take billions of years using every traditional computer resource in existence. What's interesting is RSA for 20 years used to give this, uh, I think it was a $10,000 or $100,000 reward to break this largest prime. Every time someone would break large primes, they would offer a bigger prime and offer more money. RSA last year said we're no longer offering the reward. 
that should tell you something, that they, they no longer want to give away $100,000. Um, quantum computers can break. Encryption algorithms rely upon that work effort needed to factor large prime numbers. Quantum computers with 49 to 10,000 stable qubits can do it in 100 seconds. We've got 72 today. So we're headed there, and it's, and it's ramping up. Every year we're at least adding a factor, an exponential factor to it. So how does it do it? Uh, and this is, when I heard that, I was like, okay, so you get quantum computers, and they can guess as many guesses all at once uh, of all the possible prime numbers. They can do it, here it is, here's all your prime numbers. I was like, okay, I can kind of get that. You got every possible state, but how can I as a human being then go find the right answer among the other quadrillions of answers? And Peter Shore has said that. So to simplify it, what he said was, you take every answer in the computer and you convert it to a sine wave. And when you get the two primes that are the right primes, together, they're the largest, tallest sine wave. So what quantum computers do is in an instant, bleep, here's every possible prime number that could possibly be with only one right answer and everything else wrong. And then they look, they, they convert them to sine waves, and then they just look for the tallest sine wave, and that's the two appropriate primes. That's how they do it. And that's why it takes 100 seconds or 120 seconds or whatever. It isn't, they, they get every possible answer in a, in a second, in a millisecond. It just takes long to find the highest sine wave. So many physicists think that it will, we have enough stable qubits within five years. If it's not already done today, we always have to assume that some nation state like the NSA has already done it years ago. Uh, we just don't know about it. But most people think it's at least five years off. It used to be 10 years off. Matter of fact, probably about 20 years ago, I was giving a talk on quantum computers, and a friend of mine, uh, Bruce Schneier, who does a lot of, you know, he's like the father of computer crypto, he was walking by me, and I said, someone said, how long do you think we break quantum crypto? I said, oh, I think it's about 10 years away. And uh, Bruce walked by and he goes, how long have you been saying that, Roger? And I realized I've been saying it for like 15 years. You know, so, but uh, today, uh, uh, there's a lot more people. There's hardly anybody that doesn't think it's got, well, I don't want to say anybody. The largest group of people are probably somewhere between five to ten years, and then you have a lot of people that are below five years, so it's getting a lot closer. But who really knows? Uh, Bruce said, you know, uh, when I was talking to him about what do you think, he said, I don't know, maybe there's some problem. Turns out trying to get those answers in other universes is a big, big deal. <laughs> you know, we can't get all the answers from another universe. He said, you don't know what uh, technological wall we'll run into. So, but let me say what the NSA thinks. The NSA thinks that in 2016, you were supposed to be preparing <laughs> for this coming quantum break. So that they released a fact that said, NSA believes the time is now. So how many people in this room have been preparing for the quantum supremacy and quantum breaks since 2016? Most people not. Although, interesting enough, I do run into some Fortune 500 people, uh, and, and certainly at colleges and stuff like nearby, where they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a guy uh, like that works at Shell and you know Exxon and stuff like that where they have really powerful supercomputers. They've actually been preparing for this, uh, trying to take advantage of it. Uh, but they released this, said, now is the time. The time is now right. A couple of years ago. So how can you prepare? First of all, is what, are the, what does the different breaks look like? different scenarios look like. Well, it's, it could be that it's already happened, but we don't know about it. Some nation states done it, but they're not telling us, and we won't know about it for a long time. Even like the, the whole public key crypto, I love that story. Uh, you know, RSA's public key crypto uh, invented or discovered by Diffie Hellman. They thought they did in 1976. It turned out it was actually a British guy, Clifford Babcock or something, Clifford something, uh, back in the year before, and they didn't unclassify that he, he had created the public key algorithm until like 1999. <laughs> so it takes a long time for those nation states to actually tell people they've done something, but I think it says something that our NSA and NIST is now saying, you should prepare now, and they're actually creating a contest to create post-quantum uh, computing crypto. Uh, it could be that's going to happen in the next few years. Could be happen that's going to ha happen after the next few years. You know, let's say ten years, or it could be that's never going to happen. What I would say is that it's probably going to happen the way that things are looking now. So I wouldn't say that it's never going to happen. Uh, now, when it does happen, who is going to start using it? Could be that it stays in the realm of nation states for a long time because it's really expensive to do right now. But you can actually buy quantum computers today. There are dozens and dozens, nearly a hundred companies working on it. And there's already several places on the internet where you can rent time and do quantum computing today, sometimes for free. Uh, so it's not like you even have to own your own quantum computing. They'll let you rent it. Uh, IBM's had one for a long, long time. There's at least three now where you can go on the Internet and play with quantum computing. And if you want to do the IBM one that's been around the longest, you just have to submit a form and show them why you think you need quantum computing time, but then you get it for free. 
Uh, so it's already kind of free. Uh, and past crypto breaks, you know, went from the realm of millions of dollars to accomplish to tens of thousands to just a hundred dollars. So if we look at like the Shaw One break that Google did, uh, I was for 10 years giving talks saying, oh, it costs two million dollars to break a Shaw One hash or something. Now it's a hundred bucks to break a Shaw One key, but we're all on Shaw Two, so everything's safe. Um, most people that are really worried about this U.S. government are already doing things. They're already assuming that it's been done or could be done soon. And if someone, the, the amazing thing about the break is that even as let's say it takes another five or ten years, if they take your encrypted traffic that has critical information and they just save it, when the quantum break comes, they can read all your information then. So, you know, even if they're just a couple of years away, right now, I'm sure that nation states are just saving all that encrypted traffic for the day that they can break it already, you know, to save. So if you don't want it to be, if you've got very critical information, you probably don't want it flying around in your Wi-Fi network, right? You want to start asking yourselves, how can I protect it? And the government actually has special cards uh, that don't physically don't allow the information to get out. It's like a ten thousand dollar network card. You put it in here, and you put it in here, and you got special routers. But they literally protect it so it can't be stolen or sniffed. They don't rely upon the encryption to protect the data. They actually use a physical barrier of some type to prevent it from being sniffed. So uh, if we're lucky, the quantum break is going to proceed globally, like the SHA one, the SHA two migration. When I was at Microsoft, I probably did. Well, I certainly did more than anybody else in Microsoft did helping people get their PKIs upgraded from SHA-1 to SHA-2. I even wrote a white paper on it and, um, and, and helped hundreds of people do that migration. It was a pain in the butt if you haven't done it before. But really what it brought to me even back then was you're going to have to update all of your crypto. Right? Crypto has a certain definitive life. We don't know what it is, but it's all going to fall. That's just the nature of crypto. The attackers get better. The attacks get better. They always break the crypto. And so what you need, something. if you haven't heard this term before, you need to live this term now. Crypto agility. Crypto agility is the idea that you expect all crypto that your company uses and all the products that they use, that that crypto that it uses one day will become broken. And you want the products and devices that you buy to be crypti, crypto agile so that you can pop out the crypto, flip it in with something else, and be able to go on and use something stronger and better. Crypto agility is a word you should use. Uh, and so it might be slow, and we might be all prepared in time uh, before it all gets broken, or it might happen faster, right? There may be one day that we learn that the Chinese weren't lying, they weren't bluffing, they had broken it years ago, and they've been still in our secrets forever. I mean, that may come a day that someone finds that out. Um, so it could happen faster than we think. But what I remember, again, NSA said to move post-quantum in 2016. If I, when I go talk to crypto vendors, I'm like, hey, what's your post-quantum crypto plan look like? They're like, huh? Right? It sounds like I used to go ask, hey, what are, you know, what are you doing for SHA-2? Huh? It's not good when the vendor that's doing crypto for you doesn't even know what the term is and doesn't know about the NIST white paper and stuff like that. But it's a good time to start asking your vendors. If you rely upon encryption products from your vendors going, hey, what, is, what are you doing for crypto agility? What are you doing to prepare for the post-quantum world? And if they don't know, they should know. Pressure them to know. I guess that it's likely to be a mixture of us being prepared and not prepared when the time comes, because it literally breaks almost everything. So here's how you prepare. This is the reason why you came here. Education, use this slide deck, uh, keep up on the advances, the major advances. I'd say about every three to six months they have some new advance in the quantum computing world. Talk to your vendors, let your company know about this issue, talk to your th third parties. But I love to say, take a data protection inventory of all the data that you're protecting today and ask yourself, what data would be bad if my company or organization, if it was three years from now, made public? So we think it's encrypted, it's on the Wi-Fi network or wherever it is. If that information was able to be sniffed and later on broken, well, maybe we shouldn't have it on the network. So start taking a data protection inventory from a crypto standpoint and going, what's so valuable that we have to make sure it doesn't go around on the normal network that we're keeping on special protected networks? And what's the risk if a quantum break was to come around and somebody was sniffing it? Use and be moving towards quantum resistant crypto where you can, where and when possible. That's almost nowhere now, <laughs> unless you're creating your own applications. Pressure your vendors over the quantum break preparation and crypto agility. And by crypto agility, again, it's not just the quantum stuff. It's SHA-1 to SHA-2 to SHA-3. 
right? We know that's coming. Uh, the, NIST is already saying that we shouldn't use SHA-2, that we should be using SHA-3, <laughs> you know, but it was funny. We're like, we're doing everything we can to get people from SHA-1 to SHA-2. SHA-3, thanks coming soon. We need crypto agility in our products. And it was funny, I was at Microsoft and I was uh, in most of their PKI teams. I was in the uh, working groups, I was working with all of our customers. And all of a sudden I remember Microsoft Research about five years ago came out with this term of crypto agility and they're starting to make sure it was in all of our policies and thinking about that. And I was like, man, this is so strange though. Well, where did this word crypto agility come from all of a sudden and why do they care so much about it? And you know, then two years later I learned, hey, they were making quantum computers. <laughs> and they're thinking there's going to be a day when they're able to break that. Um, so at least demand crypto agility. Start talking to that with your vendors, trying to get it switched up. Prevent eavesdropping on very high value data. It can be done. Also, symmetric encryption is not as vulnerable. AES is still good if you double your key size. So if you're using AES as symmetric encryption to protect your data, and it's really critical that you protect it for 10 years, double your key size now. Because if they sniff it and take it, they're not going to be able to break it three years from now or five years from now. So you should double your key size now. There's also a, a post-quantum crypto symmetric-based cipher called Snow 3G you can look into. Unfortunately, public key crypto is used to protect the transmission of those plain symmetric keys most of the time, right? That's how it works. So you want to start looking at post-quantum stuff or what's called quantum resistance. So there is quantum resistant hashes, Lamport, signatures, Merkle, which is Diffie, Helm, and Merkel. I don't know if you, didn't, don't know if you know, but it was Diffie, Diffie, Helm, and Merkel. There's three guys involved in it. But the third guy dropped out because he was worried about being sued because the government was actually saying they're going to sue them for espionage. I'm sure he wishes he would have taken the risk now. But Diffie, Helm, and they always, they always include his name when they're speaking. Speaks Plus. I love Picnic. Picnic Signature Algorithm. And they, uh, in Microsoft and their PKI, Active Directory Certificate Services, we actually uh, did a demonstration where we, could, we included that, that quantum resistant hash in our PKI as a demonstration effort. And we're trying to improve the crypto agility of the products. Uh, there's also, there's a lot of encryption that doesn't rely upon asymmetric stuff at all. Uh, like Kerberos, right? If you're in a Windows network or something like that, or even if you're in Linux, Unix, and using Kerberos, that's all symmetric stuff. Um, and the, the, if you're using your cell phone today, cell phone uses GSM, global, what's that stand for? Global signaling modulation. I don't know. I can think of Hedy Lamar's name, but I can't think of the technology that she kind of helped pick. But uh, that is already this huge, symmetric, global solution. So it's not like we don't have answers. It isn't like when they break it that we can't make the crypto that can solve it. We're already using globally widespread crypto that is quantum resistant. And I love this one. Super singular, isogeny, Diffie-Hellman, key exchange. Okay, they're still in the game. Forty years later, they're still coming up with it. <laughs> I like this ring learning with errors, key exchange. I would like ring learning without errors, but obviously I don't know enough about the technology. Our new hope, that's a Google project. Google's messing with post-quantum encryption with their projects. And then you've got different models. They're called lattice-based or multivariate-based or code-based. And if you want to see all the post-quantum crypto stuff, go to Wikipedia and just put in post-quantum crypto and it will talk about all the protocols and you look and see how they're made in the math. Unfortunately, almost none of them are generally available. Eh, you can't see this. This just came out the other day. NIST has actually announced a contest for vendors and people to submit post-quantum crypto uh, stuff, kind of like they did for SHA-1 and SHA-2 and AES and all that stuff. And uh, they've now, two or three years later, selected the finalists for round two, and it's 17 different crypto. Fro I love Frodo. Frodo KEM. Got to love that guy. He's probably got Hobbit Key Exchange in there or something but bike, saber, three bears made it. But so if you're trying to figure out what quantum crypto you should start playing with, it's probably one of these, right? One of these is going to end up being the eventual winner a couple of years from now. So I think round two goes for two years, and then they'll have a third round for two years, and then they'll announce the cipher. But, you know, of course, if there's some type of post, uh, some big quantum break, they'll just announce the winner sooner, I guess. That just came out a couple days ago. There are quantum random number generators, and there's ones you can use on the internet. What's interesting about uh, random number generators, um, random number generators have never been random. 
until quantum, uh, you know, it, it turns out that digital binary computers cannot be random. Their their source of um, source of truth for generating random number generators ends up going back to a quartz crystal that's on the motherboard that beats a certain billions of times per second, and it's very even number of billions of times a second, and so it's very predictable. So the truth is you cannot have a random number, a true random number generator on a binary computer. Quantum random number generators are truly, provably the first random numbers you can ever get. And there's plenty of them on the internet. Search for random number generator and just say go and it will give you some random number generator. Which really beats, you know, uh, the, the introducer was saying, oh, I've written 10 books on computer security. Uh, what I hate is that there is a book on Amazon called uh, 10,000 Random Digits. Anyone ever seen it on Amazon? You just open a page and press your finger. It's just like a bunch of random numbers. If you have not seen that book, it's from Digital Research called A, a Million Random Digits. It has outsold every book I've ever written. Uh, but the comments are hilarious. You'll, you'll, you'll spend an hour just looking at the comments that people have written about that. But it really makes me mad that A Million Random Digits outbeats every book I've ever written or will read. Apparently, my mind, the, the cohesive thoughts I put in my mind don't sell as well as randomness. Um, well, there's quantum key distribution and quantum encryption, perfectly secure in theory. Although I laugh, they're like, you'll never break quantum encryption because if you observe it, you know, it breaks it. Uh, every quantum encryption project they've done so far has been hacked, right? Because quantum theory is great, but practice is a little bit tougher. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is that most quantum resistant asymmetric ciphers require larger key sizes, not all of them, like Sphinx, the signature is only 1K, but if you look at some of these, look, look some of the key sizes are 115 KB. I can tell you that an 8-bit, an 8-kilobit key will crush most computers today. 16 KB, well, like if you're generating and sending an encrypted email with a 16 KB key, that is going to crush your productivity. Here they're saying, hey, you might need 115 in some cases. So just keep in mind as you go to implement post-quantum crypto that the key sizes can be large enough that they slow it down. What do I mean by that is you want to be careful not to, like suppose you decide oh, we're going to convert everything to quantum crypto. You really don't want to do that because most of the stuff you have doesn't need to be quantum protected. But on top there's a, you know, it's going to slow down everything. You only want to protect with quantum the stuff that needs to be protected with quantum. There is an open, uh, really cool open source project called the Open Quantum Safe Project, it's dedicated to helping people implement post quantum crypto. They even have an open source C library, Lee, uh, library, lib, lib, open quantum safe to implement some post quantum ciphers. Got an API testing and benchmarking. So that's pretty cool. So if you're thinking about playing around with it, your project, you can go hang out with people that really look at this stuff all day long and do testing and benchmarking. Also, if you have any products where you can uh, enable perfect forward secrecy, uh, perfect forward secrecy it happens in HTTPS, it happens in Kerberos sometimes, but what it does is it says change the symmetric key that's used more often. So like a lot of times when you go to a website, your public-private key that has been exchanged is uh, good for the entire session while you're on the web to that website. It may even be the same key that's used the next day if you just close down your laptop. Perfect forward secrecy says change it every megabyte, every 10 megabytes, every gigabyte, every 10 minutes, whatever change the keys that are used. So if someone captures that, if they break one part of it, they're not breaking uh, more data. And, you know, just be prepared that more of your secrets may become known. There could be that people in this world have the secrets, have sniffed your traffic, and, you know, I don't know how your stuff could be more well-known. I mean, they have, like, what, like 2 billion passwords and all the email. Like, everything's already out there. I have friends that call me, they're like, hey, uh, I'm thinking about using Tor or something to do something. And I'm like, whatever you're thinking about doing on Tor, if it's illegal, do not do it. Because the government's got it figured out. They keep arresting these guys left and right. Tor may be great, but there's nothing to say that the CIA and FBI don't own the majority of the Tor exit nodes. And you get everything you have. We have no way of knowing that. So um, I always say, if you're going to do something illegal on the Internet, don't. <laughs> Because they tend to they tend to find out if you if you come to their interest where they want to look at you, uh, but certainly uh, quantum is probably going to make that happen more often that web stuff stolen. But so quantum computers are likely to break traditional public key crypto soon. But you can start preparing now. How would I suggest you prepare? At least make people in your environment that care about crypto aware of it. Share this slide deck and just start thinking about again. You want to what's that word I said to remember? 
crypto agility. You want to start asking your vendors and your partners and you know people that are interested in this, is this product crypto agile? And they're like, whoa, what's that mean? Well, we need to talk because one day you are going to have to update it. Uh, probably the most common question that people ask me after this talk is where can I learn more about quantum computers? What's the best book? There is no best book. They all are horribly hard. I've been uh, doing quantum, and there's probably some people in here who've written books on quantum crypto. I apologize. I'm just not that smart. Every book I read on quantum crypto does nothing but hurt my head. So what I tell people is just like every video, like there's 20 videos on YouTube saying a simple explanation of how quantum encryption or quantum works. It's, you're just not going to understand it your first time around. You're going to look at that video and go, I don't know what the hell that was. They just told me stuff that is impossible, and he said a bunch of other gunk. And then you go get the second video, like, well, this guy said it a totally different way, and now my head hurts twice. I can only say just start digging in. You can find lots of stuff on the Internet. There is no simple, easy explanation for quantum computing and mechanics. I mean, there are some little tidbits. You're like, oh, I got this. One particle can be two bits. That's where it's like, that was the easiest part. <laughs> but uh, uh, also remember at uh, knowbefore.com forward slash resources, we have a lot of free tools and white papers, which not surprisingly, I wrote a lot of the white papers. Uh, but if you have any other questions and we don't get to them today, you can email me at rogerg at knowbefore.com. We do have uh, a couple of minutes. Anybody want to ask a quantum question besides arguing with me? Yeah, a ten billion dollar contract. Yeah, the China. Uh, so we are a great question. So uh, NSA just announced that they awarded one point three billion dollars for quantum, you know, post quantum encryption. To Alibaba got ten billion. I didn't know that. There's no export. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Dr. Mark Jackson's uh, Cambridge computing, he's working with both foreign and local, you know, companies, so I, I don't know how that works. Uh, well, we don't know for sure it's broken, but... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 you know, it's going to take us 20 years to perfect it to where it's safe and we're not hacking it left and right every day. We'll probably go to a pass, you know, passwordless society. Your data is already all known. We're in the wild, wild west today. It's, it's funny. Back in the 1990s, I predicted that we'd beat computer security, or computer security would defeat all badness, because I was like, wow, we got, you know, McAfee's antiviruses detecting everything, starting to catch some of these hackers. I think we got this. I'm not sure if I want to stay in this profession. I think we'll have this all solved. Um, it just gets worse every year. It is just horrible, horrible. It's a great profession. I have 20 years left till I retire, and I'm glad I picked this profession. Uh, anybody in computer security, just, uh, you know, tell your friends and colleagues, or tell anybody, uh, I get a lot of people saying, oh, should I go into computer security? Yes, yes, it's a high paying field. At Microsoft, we needed, uh, when I left Microsoft last year, we needed 100,000 positions just in IT security. And I know before, you know, we can't hire people. We can have, especially if you're a programmer, I say program in IT security, that is your quickest way to a six figure job in the shortest amount of time. But uh, yeah, on the quantum stuff, I, I just keep waiting for the day when they break it. and. Yeah, I kind of see it as like, a, what do they call it, the year 2000? Remember Y2K? There was panic, and people were like, Y2K, it was a joke, nothing happened. Nothing happened because we panicked for a year and a half. <laughs> you know, had no one done anything, it would have been a big deal. So they, <laughs> if someone was to announce today that quantum computers are breaking traditional public key crypto, we'd be in a world of hurt. I mean, that means v people are like, well, does that break blockchain? Does that break, you know, uh, Bitcoin? Yes, it does break Bitcoin, but it also breaks Visa, <laughs> right? <laughs> The least of our problems is a cryptocurrency. Any other questions, Lizzie? So quantum supremacy is the, you know, when quantum computers can actually do more calculations than traditional binary computers. We're certainly a lot closer to that, even with the annealing type of computers, which are up to 2,048 bits. But the quantum break is the day when we can factor large primes, essentially, and break traditional public key crypto faster. What do I think the what? What do I think about the month? 
I don't know yet. So uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, after the quantum break happens, I'm hoping we're prepared and it's already old hat or something like that. But, it, you know, it would be, I, I mean, it would shut down the Internet, right? If we're not prepared for it and it breaks TLS and HTTPS, I mean, that's a pretty big deal, right? That's the way the Internet works. Visa works that way. Every financial transaction in the world. But uh, I, I think, you know, I hope it's like the SHA-1 to SHA-2 migration. We're like, hey, you need to get going. You need to do it now. you got to do it by the end of the year. And then Google's like, yeah, we're breaking it for 100 bucks. You know, we've broken our first crypto prime keys or whatever. You're like, okay, everybody needs to move. That's how I hope it goes. But we just don't know. Be aware of it. Crypto agility. And I know I'm not that smart after reading this stuff, i got to tell you. Thanks a lot, y'all. Have a good rest of the conference.